Hey folks, Doug Blake with Body Design University. Welcome to another weekly study. And today in this video, although we've done an actual chapter level study on chapter 16 or the core in the seventh edition of NASM's textbook, I'm going to dig down a little bit deeper into it. Um, and this is in response to a uh, post that we had in the Facebook group uh, that was asking for a little bit more assistance and and I get it. The struggle is real because people are always asking about particular chapters. And in general, it's going to be an issue related to memorization or in some way, shape or form, trying to connect your ability to understand what's happening in the in the chapter with some sort of real world engagement that most of us have with a particular area. So in the uh, case of the core, which is what chapter 16 talks about, a lot of folks just have no connection to this information. In other words, we hear about core stabilization training, but what really is that to most people? It's abdominal training and doing a couple of twists to the side here and there. And so core and abdominal uh, training become interchangeable. And that's not, that's not what core training is. And so what NASM does and what NASM does very well is uh, really establish some basic information that will allow you in to take into the real world a number a number of pieces of good information. And so, um, and I've said it before, their transition from the sixth to the seventh edition, they did a great they did a great job. Certain things they they um, added and changed, but again, just the engagement with the material, I thought they did a they did a really good really good job with. So, <clears throat> again, in response to one of the students posting and asking man, this is, I'm struggling with chapter 16. Now, I'm not sure if, if the individual was struggling with the previous 15 chapters and hasn't gotten around to chapter 17 through 23. But look, when we talk about any of, any of the chapter level type of scenarios, I want to do a couple of things for you. First and foremost is kind of break down the chapter in a way that's going to allow you to, you know, kind of uh, eat through the material, so to speak. And when I'm, when I'm saying that, I mean, hit one, just eat it, digest it, nail it, memorize it, and do it in, in a way that is sequenced throughout the chapter. Because remember, you always have to look at the editor. How did they write the chapters? How did they write the books? And in NASM's case, and this is relevant, trust me, to chapter 16, what they did was they said, we want you to memorize the material. It's a lot of material. What are, what are they going to do? They can't make the test easy and they can't make this book this thick. They've got to give you the material, but they're giving it to you in a way that, that guides you through the memorization process. And just keep in mind, um, and this goes for every chapter. Look what they've done. And I've got my book. If you, have your, if you have your book, open it up. If you're using the online version of the book, that's fine as well. <clears throat> I have it on my computer, but I like to toggle back and forth depending on what I'm doing. But when it comes to straight studying like this, sometimes it's easier for me, a guy my age that's so accustomed to doing this, um, to just use a book. NASM has given you learning objectives. That's critical. First thing you do in any chapter, and of course, this is chapter 16, look at those learning objectives and write them down. Remember, read, write, recite. And you know, I've say it, uh, say it a thousand times, if I say it once, is that you've got to rewrite it. So I got my pad. I've got a, um, this is a dry erase marker. Now I use this in the book, by the way, just to, just to highlight those areas that I know are going to be more uh, translatable to the exams and to some information that is going to help you in the real world. And then a pen, rewrite it, draw it. Remember, I'm, I'm not into highlighting, but if you're into highlighting and that helps you memorize it, then good for you. I just know that nine out of 10 people that tell me they highlight, it doesn't help them. Why? Because it's just rereading and rereading. You can reread, but make sure you write it after you read it. Um, so in particular, uh, again, to, to all of you that are, uh, that are having struggles with this particular chapter, uh, make sure you go through and look at the learning objectives and write them down and just look and spend a little bit of time in there. Then, of course, the next thing you do is look at your chapter. You've got your chapter title and then you've got your major headings inside the chapter. My recommendation, whether it's 16 or whatever, is to look at what NASM has done for you. Introduction to core training, 
okay, they, and by the way, they give you key definitions. Make sure you write down what core stability is. What is core endurance? And it's interesting because uh, they basically tell you everything you need to know from a testing perspective right off the bat for what core training is all about. Um, I believe chapter 16, if you use the study guide that we have, it'll tell you whether it's a low, moderate, or high priority chapter. Um, nevertheless, the, the goal here is to memorize as much of this as you can, make it, make it functionally workable for you so you can regurgitate the information on a test. Um, and for this individual, he, he was going through the quizzes. And you know, if you're struggling with quizzes, you need to go immediately back to the question you got wrong and just look at the answers and then navigate through the, the text itself and ask yourself, why did I get that wrong? Oh, so here it is. And then write it, rewrite it, read it, then rewrite it again, say it out loud, and that should help you it, with the memorization process. Um, chapter 16 starts on page 13, and it's not a long chapter. And ironically enough, it's a pretty short chapter, but they do give you a bunch of exercises. It's the one one of a couple of these chapters where I actually would tell you it's not a bad idea to kind of know the names, the terms, and what the importance of these particular exercises are for. And again, because it's not that long of a chapter, it shouldn't take much time to actually memorize it. So by the time you get to page 542, chapter is done, you basically had about 10, 12 pages just of exercises alone. But let's go through it um, so you get the basic outline of what chapter 16 should look like. Introduction to core training. Um, and as soon as you turn the page, you are now going to hit into one of the main one of the main elements of this chapter, which is the uh, distinction between the local and the global musculature. Remember, the core is not the abdominals. The core is is the entirety of what's known as the lumbopelvic hip complex, right? All the way down into into the, the muscles that work over and function over the hip and deal with pelvic movement all the way up to the diaphragm. Technically, if you want to get technical, um, the rotators, for instance, go all the way up to the spinal column, the spinalis muscle, all of these muscles, um, you know, that technically, if you wanted to call them the, the core, you could. Why? Because they are the local core muscles. And so that's your first distinction. And, and it's a you know, it's uh, paramount that you simply write uh, table 16.1, get your pen and pencil, and you literally just go ahead and examples of local and core muscles. And what I would do is I would, I'm going to do it with you. How about that? Grab a pad, get your textbook, and I'll do it with you right here. Okay. Local. And now you can read uh, core musculature. Yes, that's fine. Get right into your local muscles. What are the local? And you know, I get it, the terminology. Who came up with the term local and global? I don't know. Um, what are your local muscles? Those are the muscles closest into the spinal column. Okay, so you just got to remember local muscles, write them down. The uh, rotators, what do they do? Stabilize, rotate spinal segments. And I'd write that down. Okay, and I would do it again. Uh, multifidus, stabilize. Um, by the way, if you want to call it multifidus, I do that sometimes, but it's technically the multifidus. Stabilize, extend, rotate spine. Write it down. Take a look at it. Oh, those are those guys right at the spine. That's what allows you to effectively turn, right? So those are the spinal rotators. Um, transverse abdominus. You've heard of transverse abdominus. I don't know. Um, write down the diaphragm and go through table 16.1, um, pelvic floor musculature. Quadratus lumborum. Have you ever heard of that one? Okay, so your quadratus lumborum. I mean, it's functionally a critical muscle. Okay, whether you've known it or, or not. So write it, but write it down. Quadratus lumborum, lateral flexion of spine, elevation of pelvis, right? It tilts the pelvis because it attaches right into the spinal and lower rib, uh, lower rib cage area. So um, just write that down. And then, right, here's your global. Write those down. Your, these are the muscles that we talk about. We talk about the core, right? These are the global 
quote, global or those muscles involved with dynamic, dynamic movements of the body, right? So the abdominals, obliques, internal, external obliques, um, the lower back or erector spinae, the lats, latissimus, dorsi, right? Um, and the uh, two muscles that make up what's known as the iliopsoas or the iliacus and the psoas muscle. <clears throat> and they give you some good pictures. So you, you get the idea. That's what I'm doing to memorize those, memorize those muscles. Okay, so then if you get a question on the test or a quiz question that says, um, which of the following muscles is a local muscle that um, turns or rotates the spine and you've got quadratus, quadratus lumborum, latissimus dorsi, multifidus. Well, you already know, so if you do it over and over a couple of times, it's going to stick in your brain. So you got to know the local and global musculature from chapter 16. Please remember, I can't and no other, nobody else that's even, you know, more educated is going to help you to memorize. There's no way anybody can get you to memorize the material. You've got to figure out the way that works best for you. The read, write, recite methodology just seems to work for the majority of people, but draw it. I'm not good at drawing, but I can, I mean, at least I can look and go, okay, spinal column. And then I just draw some little things. Here's my rotators, my multifidus kind of rides over side, and then I can draw and it's going to stick in my, it's going to stick in my brain. So now I'm going to move on. So local, what's important about local muscles? Well, they tell you that, I mean, they're giving you literally the information that you will probably see on an exam question. Local, here's a great exam question. Uh, you know, local, the core muscles, um, local core muscles are made up predominantly of what muscle fiber type? It's basic, straightforward, type one. These are endurance fibers. Okay, so, but it's right there for you. So again, use the, use the, um, use the techniques and then utilize the resources that NASM has given you in the textbook itself, which is memorizing some of these terms and some of these attributes and then use your tables. Okay. So now as you move on, remember that is a key component to chapter 16, local versus global. Um, I've done a couple, couple of videos. Um, you can go check them out, of course, uh, uh, specifically on the, just the local um, muscles of the core and the global muscles of the core, just to talk a little bit more about them. And so uh, for sure, check those out. Now we move on to page 519, importance of properly training the core muscle. Again, it's not that it's not important. It's just a question of, are you going to see a lot of material that's going to be represented from this particular part of the, of the um, chapter? If you read through it, just make sure that you're looking at your chap, your little um, headings here. So scientific rationale for core training, optimizing posture. So again, what NASM does is it says, this is important information. And here are the terms that you need to memorize. Lordotic lordosis, kyphotic or uh, um, kyphosis, anterior, posterior pelvic tilt. Okay. We'll take a look at that. And there's nothing wrong with spending some time trying to memorize that. But in chapter 16, I'm going to tell you one of the, one of the most valuable figures in this entire textbook, in my opinion, is right here, um, figure 16.5, posterior pelvic tilt. Why? Because, you know, I have it marked. When you look at these photos, if it was me, I would draw these out. From a lateral perspective, the movement of the pelvis, that's what the core is, right? It's going to basically equate to how the pelvic, uh, the pelvis is stabilized with respect to the hip joint, with respect to the uh, lumbothoracic area, uh, all of these, all of these areas that are that are functionally connected and associated with the pelvis, right? Lumbopelvic hip complex. Ultimately, all of these muscles, in some way, shape, or form, appear to have some sort of functional engagement with the pelvis. This figure right here. You know, everybody asks about, well, overactive, underactive muscles. This is a great way 
to get a to get a feel for this. What I do is I draw a circle which represents the pelvis. Now you gotta you gotta kind of think about this. If you look at figure 16.4 and 16.5, you have the anterior pelvic tilt and posterior. What do you what do you see? You see hip flexors, abdominals, erector spinae. Hip flexors, abdominals, erector spinae. And that's what you would draw. You would line down for hip flexors, abdominals, erector spinae. And now you could have hamstrings down here too, but basically you have this rotational movement. Think of a steering wheel, you know, like a car steering wheel. What do I got that I can use for a steering wheel? Okay, I'll take my phone. So you're driving, driving a car. I think this is like one of the, that, isn't this like the shape of the, um, uh, the new electric cars that they got or the, uh, some series, Elon Musk. So you got the steering wheel. Imagine pulling one side and this other side pulling up, right? So you've got this rotary movement like this. And so anterior, posterior pelvic tilting, think about it. You've got muscles that pull up and draw up this way. And on that same side, you've got muscles that pull and draw down. On the other side, you've got the same thing. You've got muscles that draw up and muscles that pull down. And that's basically what you're seeing here in figure 16.4 and 16.5. Um, overactive this, underactive this. In other words, the overactive, and I'll, I'll use 16.4. So stay with me here on page 521. Figure 16.4, anterior pelvic tilt, okay? underactive abdominals, meaning the abdominals ain't pulling the way they should pull. So they're allowing, they're lengthening and allowing the, those muscles that are overactive, i.e. the hip flexors, to, um, to pull one way. So remember what I said. If the muscle from here pulling up this way relaxes, it allows this movement to occur like this, these guys, if they're overactive, they're pulling. So they work simultaneously. One is underactive and the other is overactive and it pulls one way. And then on the reverse side, you have that same type of scenario <clears throat> where in the case of um, overactive erector spinae, you probably have underactive hamstrings, although it doesn't say it, it's probably what's happening. <clears throat> so and then you look over strong downward pull. And this is where people get confused because I've seen this question. Well, can one muscle be overactive in one case and underactive in another case? And the answer is, well, of course they can. I mean, muscles lengthen and shorten <clears throat> depending on the, the distortion issue, distortion syndrome. Um, a, a particular muscle in one person can be overactive and then in another person be underactive. That's why we have an anterior pelvic tilted in a situation and a posterior pelvic tilted situations because the hamstrings are underactive here and they're overactive here. The uh, hip flexors are overactive here, underactive here. Certain muscles though, to be honest with you, generally don't become underactive. They're normally always overactive. And you can see that um, in, the, in the textbook in NASM, we'll talk about them. But one of the things you should notice, like I, and I've circled it, in figure 16.4, strong downward pull of the psoas, and that's going to allow for this uh, uh, tilting of the, of the pelvis or allow for the tilting of the pelvis. Yet in 16.5, this strong upward pull of the, of the psoas, iliopsoas complex, uh, tilts the pelvis backwards. So there you go. I mean, it's a classic example of muscles that are being um, that are being lengthened in one case and being shortened in another case. So again, look at this. This is a really, like I said, figure 16, four and 16, five are very, very helpful and very, uh, I think very engaging if you look at it and really appreciate and start to understand what's happening um, with this. And uh, look, if you, if you have a question on any of these, on any of these particular areas, you can always <clears throat> leave a comment and I can go over them specifically. Scoliosis, just so you know, remember, um, lateral view, you have these lordotic and kyphotic curves, normal, you can have lordosis, which is over exaggeration of the lordotic curve, kyphosis, exaggeration of the normal kyphotic curve. But as soon as I look front or back, 
and I see lateral deviation of the spinal column, a little bit that is normal. I actually have very minor, <clears throat> very minor scoliosis. Just my pelvis is tilted just a tiny bit. Um, it has zero, it's had zero, well, maybe a tiny bit of pathological issues associated with it. But if you look at figure 16, six, for instance, you can see a severe case. And I've trained, um, <clears throat> I've trained some folks and I trained one, uh, one woman um, who's in her mid to late fifties uh, with severe scoliosis. And when I say severe, I'm talking, this is, this creates a pathological condition because then her organs are being squeezed and crushed and pushed this way. And she, um, and she had to, she had to exercise, but wow, it was really quite amazing to see um, the level, the level of lateral deviation that she had her and hers was way up in her way up in the thoracic, almost into the cervical spinal area. Of course, the entire spine is laterally deviated, but was really pronounced. Um, so it happens. As you move on through chapter 16, um, if you if you are so inclined, you can read through the stretch your knowledge. It's not a bad idea. Just keep in mind, and I've said that through the study guides that for the most part, that type of material is generally not going to be on the test. Okay. Anything that shows studies, right? They're helpful in, I guess, if you want to say the real world, but they're generally not going to ask questions based on, you know, the Lego Fuentes study um, done in 2018, right? On the improved kick speed and kicking performance. Probably not going to see that on the exam. However, you should know that uh, from a performance perspective, core training um, is important for generating strong and explosive movements needed for optimal physical performance, because that can be a, a test question. You know, which of the following, blah, blah, blah. And you, you would need to know that they're talking about core training as, as opposed to standard muscular strength training. Remember, anytime you're dealing with the core, it's core strength, it's core power it's core endurance, it's core stabilization, it's core balance. All of those are, you got to have the word core in front of it. And that's what they're trying to help you to get here. So injury resistance, why, right? You got to know that core muscle function critical for proper extremity movements. Why? Because the local, the local core musculature needs to be strong to brace and hold everything spinal column in place while the global system is able to move and do the things that the global muscular system does. Rehabilitation, nothing wrong with reading through that. But now on pages 524, 525, we get into two important words. You need to know these and you should, you should be prepared to answer a question on this, the drawing in maneuver and the bracing maneuver. Uh, drawing in maneuver is just a taking right below your belly button and pulling it, pulling it in. That's the drawing in maneuver. And then of course the bracing maneuver is when you basically go and tense your rectus abdominis along with your obliques. Okay. Uh, just read through that, but they will generally ask you a question. Um, I think I've spoken to how many people and they say, oh yeah, I remember seeing a question on bracing. And it's basically contracting the global abdominals, whereas the drawing in maneuver is the local, the local musculature, particularly the um, transverse, uh, transverse abdominus. And that's what you're dealing with, with drawing and embracing guidelines on page 525, guidelines for core training. Um, table 16.2, core training variables. Uh, you would have already gone through this, but there are specifics now to core particularly with the progression, little or no motion of spine. This is the thing that you have to write down. Remember, when we're dealing with the core, you've got to make the distinction between the spinal local, mus core, uh, local muscles and the global muscles for dynamic movement. And that's what table 16.2 can help you to understand. Again, move on. Now you get into stuff you just basically have to memorize. And this is where the struggle comes in for some folks. But remember, when you start looking at some of these movements, marching, floor, and by the way, this is the core training progressions. Generally, there's three main progressions that you're, that you're moving through. Um, so one has a basic protocol. You can do, and I, I'm pretty sure you're going to see a question on marching 
just as a French floor bridge, because they'll ask a question. In order to develop the uh, dynamic uh, strength or dynamic uh, whatever or endurance of the global muscular system, you would do which exercise would be most effective for that. And because they've given you all of these, you're going, oh man, is it the medicine ball soccer throw or is it the marching? Okay, generally, now watch, as you read through this, look at the, look at the terms that are similar um, in your protocols. The easiest one, believe it or not, is the third one on page 529. Example exercises include, but not limited to, <clears throat> because this, the last progression um, that are designed to improve the rate, what do you notice about them all? Ball rotation, pass, ball pullover, throw. Do you see the word throw in any of these other ones? As soon as you see the word throw, what are you dealing with? Power and speed. So it's not that it's difficult to memorize, but if you do look at it and see what's connecting all of these together, that should help you to understand um, which, uh, which protocol these fit into because now when you get, now you're into what? Now you're into all the exercises. Uh, my recommendation on the exercises is yes, you should know the names of these. I don't know. I mean, I don't know what else to tell you. You should know that the floor Cobra is lying this way and you're doing, okay. That's not difficult to do. That's why you got these guys, write them down, draw a picture. doesn't have to be a good picture. Just draw a picture. Almost guaranteed, you draw some of these pictures out here, you will memorize them. Now we're just, folks, now we're just basically through the rest of chapter 16. You know, it's funny also because um, I notice if I ask students this, did you, read the, did you read the chapter highlights? They always say no. Did you read the summary? The answer is no. Um, they're giving you bullet points. Go through them. Trust me, go through them. It can be very, very helpful. Look. Um, Chapter 16, it's no joke. Believe it or not, it's actually a really good chapter for when you pass the NASM exam and start utilizing it in the real world. One of the things we know from athletic training, um, <clears throat> for years of athletic training, is the development of the local musculature, the, the uh, rotational elements of the spinal column. And the, you know, we used to call them the intrinsic muscles of the spine. That's what's known as the local, but the intrinsic musculature that stabilizing, holding postural control is all the local muscles. That's what's keeping you in proper position. Now, don't get me wrong, the erector spinae, important postural muscle as well, but the way NASM wants you to remember it is local global, and then you can take it from there. So I hope this, uh, this study delving a little bit more into chapter 16 was helpful. Please remember to subscribe to the channel, hit that bell and you can uh, get the notifications of the new videos that are coming out. The goal, remember our goal, the goal here is to help you pass the NASM exam on the first attempt. If you've already taken it and failed, then of course we wanna help you to pass it no matter what, what point you're at, second, third, whatever it is. That is the main goal. And we've got all the resources here at Body Design University to help you to do that. So if you have questions specifically on this video, leave me a comment. Let me know um, how I can help and assist you even further. If you want to do other studies, I'm more than happy to do that. You can post them in the Facebook group as well. Have a great weekend and we'll see you next week.